There's a need for jobs and for folks willing to hire and mentor men to start their own businesses. We need to be able to start up new businesses. I, I know people in the neighborhood who need jobs. The mentorship is starting to be there, but they need a chance. When we hire people, we try to orientate them and tell them all the things uh, that we expect in business. From the first day they were hired, it is to uh, maybe a month or two later, they're, they got a different step to their walk. It gives people an opportunity to be employed, to learn about the practical aspects of running and operating a business. It's been successful in our business because we've, we've hired some really nice folks that work hard. Well, we've got community groups uh, that are at the journey who have dedicated time every few weeks to come and work on a project together to build a playground for kids or to rebuild a local church or to just build relationships with uh, different people, even walking around picking up trash. The thing that over the last year or so I think I'm most passionate about is uh, just young people, uh, young men, guys from around 15 to 22, 23, and even some of the kids in the neighborhood. What I've seen happen over time through the sports camp that we got started is that uh, as every week people come to there and they play together, people are playing basketball or they're learning how to play soccer, and adults are just hanging out and watching the kids have a good time, it became home to people again. Instead of just seeing it as sort of like a hopeless, empty, desolate corner, now it's like, it's where the action's at. It's fun to think about. We're never going to leave Forest Park Southeast. Uh, it, it's, it's home for us and it's home for the people that live there. But what, what's happening there, we want to be able to reproduce all over the city. When we find folks that are willing to step out and get involved and say, hey, I have resources, I have a skill set, and I'm willing to focus on one specific neighborhood, what would it look like if we as, as churches in the city said, hey, we're going to make an impact, we're going to be changed uh, by taking that step and really walking into the mess of life with each other. So we're continuing in this series where we're looking at this epistle, which is what it's called, which is a word for letter. Um, so what John is doing is he is taking the teachings of Jesus and he's applying them to a local church or a group of local churches, much like ours, with people much like us, meaning that they are broken, um, they have sin in their lives, they have confusion about their sexuality, they have confusion about self-control, they have uh, theological uh, heresy that needs to be confronted and addressed and theological furniture that needs to be moved around and re rearranged. Um, so what's going on in this church, in this group of churches that he's writing to is exactly what we're dealing with. And I love it because John says um, throughout the book why he's writing this letter. And so you see this throughout, and he uses this phrase, I write these things to you. And, and our little section of Scripture, verses 5 through 10 of chapter 1, it's set off literally by chapter, I'm sorry, by verse 4, which says, I write these things to you so that our joy may be made complete. So our passage that we're looking at is about joy. Now, I love that, that John is including himself in this. He isn't just using an editorial we. He's saying, listen, my joy, church, is, is immersed with yours. I'm happy when you're happy. He is living and dying with a local church. In, in, in the New Testament times, it would be unheard of for a person to try to be a Christian apart from a local church. It just wouldn't make any sense. Look at verse 7. You see what I mean here. Verse 7, John writes, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light... One of the resultants of that is that we have fellowship with one another, sharing. Koinonia is the word, which is why it's so smart for many of you to have joined a community group like you did last week or to be in an equipped group so that you don't have to do your spirituality solo. You can actually benefit from other people. It's scary, but it's wise. And here you have a guy, John is 85 years old when he writes this. Started following Jesus when he was a teenager. So he's writing this as an old man saying, I'm, I'm happy. I'm full of joy, and I love the church, and I want you to love it too. And I'm writing to you about joy, not just any joy, complete joy. And the joy that he is proposing, the joy that he is asking, is the same joy that God promises us. Did you know that you were made for joy? You were created to experience joy. 
The, the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism says it this way. Man, in the, answering the question, why are we here? What's our chief end? Uh, man's chief end, it says, is to love God and enjoy him forever. So joy isn't something you get directly, which is why it's a little counterintuitive. Joy is something you get by pursuing something else or someone else. You don't get joy by pursuing joy. You get joy, John says, by pursuing God. And to understand joy, John says, I need you to get this message down, which is why in verse 5 he says, I'm going to talk to you about the message. Verse 5 through 10 is a nutshell of what the gospel message is. Uh, to, to have joy, John is saying, you have to understand who God is, you have to understand who you are, and you have to understand what separates you from God if you're going to have good news, if you're going to experience the gospel, if you're going to experience joy. And he answers this question, how do you experience full, complete and sustained joy. Now, in verse 5, he shows us how this happens. Look in verse 5 with me. He says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is what? Light. And in him there is no darkness. Now, this doesn't make any sense when you think about it. John's saying, you want joy, right? You want fullness of life? You want to experience something so awesome that you can't shut up about it? Okay, God is light. Doesn't really excite the room, right? I'm sure they didn't get it either. It, this is the problem with the Bible. Please don't think when you read the Bible it's going to answer every question you have about your life. It is purported that the Bible will do that. It will not. It will actually frustrate you and give you more questions. And by the way, this is how you know you're understanding the Bible, that you're frustrated by it. Because Mark Twain said it this way. He says, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that frustrate me. It's the parts of the Bible that I do understand that really frustrate me. And what happens is John is giving us an answer maybe that we don't want that's counterintuitive, but what he's saying is if you want to experience joy in your life, you have to start with God, not joy. You have to start with God, not yourself. And so John says the root of joy is from God. It doesn't, but we've got to start with God. And, and he gives a description of God in his character. That's what this whole God is light as th thing is about. So, so it doesn't matter what we say about God. It only matters what God says about himself. We can only declare about God what God declares about himself, right? Because the reality of who God is and the truth of, of who God is is not discovered, it's revealed. Knowledge about who God is is not about speculation, it's about revelation. God has to reveal himself to us. And John is saying, I want to, I want to show you who God is. God is light. Now, we don't like that because we want to look down deep in our hearts or, or look up in the sky and bring our own conception of God. But you wouldn't like it if someone did that to you, would you? I, I know I wouldn't. I wouldn't like it if someone said, okay, Darren, my conception of you is this. You live the first 20 years of your life as a quiet, orderly, Amish person in Arthur, Illinois, right? <laughs> That's what I think of you. Now, though I appreciate a good beard and like hats and horses, I didn't grow up a quiet, orderly Amish person in Arthur, Illinois. I grew up a loud, rebellious, uh, uh, obnoxious person, really, in Marion, Illinois. So you wouldn't want someone to tell you who you are, to define you based on their categories. You wouldn't want to do that to anyone else, and you, we simply can't do that with God. We have to allow God to tell us who he is and reveal himself. And so what John is saying is, if we're going to talk about joy, or anything, by the way, we start with God. A couple of reasons he does this. One reason he starts with God is he's going to correct heresy, false teaching in general in this letter and in specific in our text. And when you deal with heresy and false teaching, you don't simply just deal with the heresy or the false teaching. You deal with the truth that exposes the heresy. And so you go back to God. So that's why he's doing it. One. Two, he's doing exactly what the Bible does. The Bible itself does not start uh, it, starts, it does start with God and his character, not with us and our problems. Okay? So John is just being consistent with the Scripture. And he's doing exactly what the Bible does. The Bible says, in the beginning, God. First four words of the Bible. The rest of the Bible, if you're new, this is perfect, because the rest of the Bible is simply unpacking that, those four words. In the beginning, God, the rest of the Bible describes and reveals who God is, his character, who he is, his will, what he wants and his ways, how he works. That's the rest of the Bible. And John is saying, I want you to understand God. 
as he has revealed himself. And ultimately what you have to do is you, ha you have to, as Sinclair Ferguson, who's this great Scottish theologian guy with that thick Scottish wonderful accent that I wish I could imitate, but I can't, so I won't. He says this. He goes, you have to make a fundamental decision when you read the Bible. Is it about you and what you must do, or is it about God and what God has done? Most of us choose the former instead of the latter. And so instead of seeing God as the hero of the story, we are see ourselves as the hero. Instead of seeing God as the subject and the object or the, uh, or, the, or the main character, we see ourselves that way. And that sets us up for what John is going to call throughout this letter darkness. And he says at the beginning here in verse 5, I need to reorient you. I need to help you understand that this message about worshiping and trusting God, not worshiping and trusting yourself, that this message of the gospel and the promise of the gospel, that if you center your worship and trust on God, that you will experience joy. I need you to understand it starts with God. You have to deal with God. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. A double negative there. God is, God is light, and he is not dark. There is no darkness at all. No darkness, no darkness. What is he saying there? Well, a couple things. He's saying that God is not impersonal, number one, that he's not the, the fire from the sun or the pale gleam from the moon. It, it doesn't say that God is from light. What does it say? God is light. He's personal. The Bible teaches this throughout. Another thing it says that God is light, another uh, idea of this is that he's pure. His motivations are just and right. He always does what is loving and kind. And one of the biggest deceptions that you will fight in this fallen world is believing otherwise, thinking God is not good, not seeing God in your pain, not seeing God in your suffering, thinking that he's out to get you instead of to love you. So God is light means God is pure. It also means God is holy, that he's set apart, that he's unique, that he's untainted by sin, unaffected by darkness. God is light. And you have to start there. Now, in Scripture, God presents himself as holy before he presents himself as loving. You ask most people, what, give me your definition of God. They're going to say, well, God, God is love. And certainly, we'll get to that at the, at the end of this book. But God is first holy before he's loving. Let me, let me explain it through Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57 says, says for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is, what does it say? Holy. And this holy one says, I dwell in the high and holy place. And also with him who is of a contrite and low spirit. So God is, is above creation, but he loves creation. He's high and holy, but he loves broken people who know they're broken. So God is holy, and God is loving. His love comes out of his holiness. He doesn't love us in spite of his holiness. He loves us out of his holiness, out of his absolute moral perfection. Never set the love of God and the holiness of God against one another. You don't have to. It's, it's all connected. And what false teaching does, though, it tries to separate those. And false teaching in general does this. It reduces God's holiness and it minimizes human darkness. That's what false teaching does. It, it, it was what was going on then and it's what's going on now. And what John is saying is, I've got to start this whole thing off. You have to understand this message. You have to understand that God is light. That is good news. Bad news, though. We have darkness. Good news, God is light. Bad news, God is, we have darkness. And John exposes what these false teachers were teaching in this little phrase, if we say you see it throughout the, the verses. If we say, this is what, what he was saying is, this is what the false teachers were saying. Let me show you, verse 6. If we say, we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Verse 8. If we say, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10. If we say, we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The false teachers were saying, if, saying this all these ideas about darkness that were not commensurate with God's word. These all, if we say, are cause and effect kind of things. And what John is saying is if you want to experience God, if you want to experience holiness, if you want to walk in the light, you have to understand the darkness. You have to see it. You have to own it if it's yours. And you have to turn from it. 
your own personal darkness. Now, we're very deceived about darkness because a lot of us think that darkness is nothing but an illusion, that sin is nothing but an illusion. We just, we, we're kind of Buddhistic or Scientology gets into this. Well, it's just an illusion. It's just how you think about things. You just need to put a positive spin on it. It's not really that bad. Or, the, or, or, or that sin is only corporate or darkness is only corporate. A lot of you who are really into social justice and, and, and you know, you really love Mission St. Louis, your tendency is to go there because you tend to think, if we can just fix all these corporate systems, all these structures, then we'll fix everything. The problem is, where do all these unjust, evil structures come from? People. And so you can't just fix the structure, you have to fix the people, right? So darkness is not just corporate, it's personal, and it must be addressed that way. A lot of us think that darkness is relative. Well, what might be dark for you, Darren, is not necessarily dark for me, right? And John says, listen, you have to understand, and you have to have a, a thicker, deeper view of sin. It's more nuanced. It, it, it's more multifaceted. You have to understand darkness if you're going to walk out of it. And he talks about sin in three different ways. The first way is this. We're all familiar with this one. Sin, darkness, is in our hypocrisy. Look in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness... We lie, and we do not practice the truth. Now, this is the claim that you can have inner enlightenment, spiritually speaking, without a change externally. Hypocrisy, hear me on this, hypocrisy is not when you sin. We're all hypocrites. Do you know that about yourself? Aren't you glad you, you were told that? You're a hypocrite. So am I. You know why? None of us perfectly live what we claim to believe. That's a hypocrite in one sense. But the hypocrisy that's talked about in John here in this verse, and mainly throughout the Bible, not exclusively, but mainly, hypocrisy is not when you struggle with sin. Hypocrisy is when you use religious activity to justify your sin. Hypocrisy, hypocrisy is not when you struggle with sin. Hypocrisy is when you use religious activity to hide your sin or to justify your sin. I remember my first encounter with this. I was a sophomore in high school. Do you remember when you were a sophomore? Now, this only works if your high school had, you know, four classes. Some of you went to high schools with three, but most of the time, you're a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, and a senior. So when you're a freshman, it's bad. It's bad because you were cool in junior high and, high and and middle school and whatever, and now you're not. You're on the lowest part of the social food chain. It, it's, it's just bad news. Then sophomore, right? Uh, and, and, and you're not quite a freshman, so you're not quite a dweeb, but you're close to it. So the key is to meet some seniors. And, and, and so then you can kind of be hip, cool, and trendy and know some people and be invited to certain places. Well, th this guy, John, was a senior. And I started hanging out with him a little bit. <clears throat> and John was the first guy that I ever met that was a church guy. You ever, meet, you ever remember the first time you met somebody who was a Christ, claimed to be a Christian at church? He was the first guy that I'd ever heard talk about his faith, and everybody kind of knew he was real active. And so we were going to hang out, and we get in his car, and he, and he immediately shows me this bowl. And I'm not talking about a bowl of Fruit Loops. I'm talking about a bowl that you smoke marijuana out of. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. Others of you are, you've been educated about how to smoke marijuana in church. Aren't you glad? <laughs> he shows me this bowl, and he says, do you want to get high? And my, all the circuits in my brain are blown away. Because I'm like, you're, you're the church guy, and, and we're going to get high? The church guy's going to get me high? And this is what he said. I asked him, I said, this doesn't make sense. I explain this. This is crazy to me. He's like, man, I'm a Christian. I just like to get high. What was he saying? I've had this inner enlightenment, but it does not affect my outward behavior. Right? That's exactly what was being claimed and exactly why John is writing this letter. That somehow your belief can be quarantined from your behavior. And John is saying it cannot. You cannot claim inner transformation without outward transformation. You cannot claim to profess, uh, profess Christ if it, it, because you may not possess Christ if your life doesn't match up. See, well, it, it's hypocrisy. The word hi hypocrite comes from the word that was used to describe stage actors. Back in the day, in the, you know, in the first century, they didn't have lights and 
curtains and, and smoke and mirrors to, to kind of take your mind off and with character changes, you know, all that. So they would, they would literally play characters. They would change characters by changing masks. And you were a hypocrite, meaning that you were pretending to be somebody that you were not. You were acting like somebody you were not. That's where the word came from. And that's what we do when we try to, to claim some kind of spiritual thing that's going on in our life when, it's not, when you really can't see it demonstrated in our behavior. Hypocrisy is not when you sin. It's when you claim some kind of spiritual enlightenment that is internal that's not connected to your behavior. That's what he's talking about, hypocrisy. This is the first church I ever was a staff member in. I was 19 years old. I had no business being a staff member at a church at 19, but whatever, I was. And I found out, I've told this story before, that the pastor <clears throat> was having an adulterous relationship with several women in the church. And, and I had to confront it. And that didn't go so well because a lot of the leaders knew. And when I pressed them and said, how can you possibly... Let this guy, they said, he's such a good pastor. He's such a good counselor. What was he doing? He was using his counseling to hide his sin, right? That's hypocrisy. When you use religious activity to hide your sin. And we do it all the time, and John is calling us out. Darkness and hypocrisy. Then you see darkness in redefinition. Now look in verse 8. This is interesting. He says, if we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, this, most scholars think he's talking about this idea of what was called sinless perfection, meaning when you become a Christian, your sin nature is eradicated. Your ability to sin is destroyed. Now, this was a popular theology for many decades. It's not in the last couple. It's not kind of lost some traction. But this is how this applies now, in my opinion. We don't say as Christians or as Americans that, that we don't have sin. I mean, we use words like brokenness, all these benign words that have no definition. Uh, we use words like, oh, I've just got some, you know, problems and I, I'm, I'm certainly not perfect. We all, we, but we don't define sin the way God defines sin. So in a real sense, we are saying, verse 8, a lot, we have no sin because we redefine it so well. Example, um, I don't have a problem with anger. I just have a short fuse. I'm hot-tempered. You know, guys don't have problems with lust. They just have wandering eyes. Or like one guy told me, I just love me some women. <laughs> right? There's a famous church saying, we, I don't have a problem with gossip. I was just sharing information with them so that they would be able to pray more accurately. <laughs> I'm not a coward. I just don't want to hurt people's feelings. I'm not harsh, I'm just being authentic. What are we doing? The Bible is very clear on those sins, in vivid detail, describing them. And yet we redefine them, and basically we're saying we have no sin because we've redefined it. We don't even use the word sin. I, check yourself on this. Check yourself. When you talk about whatever you want to call the problems in your life that are the, the result of your behavior, or your attitude, how do you talk about it? You'll say things like this. Well, I have these issues. I've got this personality weakness. I've got this character flaw. I've got this hang up, right? I've got this dysfunction. I've got this brokenness. You will do it, do an audit, do a self audit on yourself. You will be shocked at how much you redefine what is clearly sin described in the scripture and you put a word on it like issues or hang ups or we do it all the time. Now, this brings me to baseball. It's not hard to bring me to baseball, but this absolutely brings me to baseball because when I used to play baseball, I was a catcher, which explains my back, hip, and knee problems currently. But when you're a catcher, the great thing about being a catcher is you're never bored. When you're playing other positions other than pitcher or catcher, you kind of can fall asleep. It's fun to go to Little League games and watch kids in right field picking flowers and laying on their back. And I mean, you can kind of get away with that. You do that when you're catching, you're going to the emergency room because there's a guy with a bat and there's a ball coming at your head, all right? So it's, it's exciting, but here's the problem with being a pitcher or a catcher, actually. You cannot show emotion 
like you can at other positions when a call doesn't go your way. You can't do it. Because if you show emotion, in other words, as a catcher, if I'm catching the ball and I, just know, and I know what a strike in a ball is when I'm a catcher, you know because you're right there. If I show emotion and I'm and, and, and mad because the umpire didn't call that clear strike, if he calls it a ball and I'm mad about it, and I show emotion, I'm embarrassing him. And you know what he does to me? Next pitch, next inning, he starts squeezing me. And so what is clearly a strike then, not even a borderline call, he calls a ball because I embarrassed him. One of the hardest things to do when you're a catcher is to let the guy behind you be the umpire. And one of the hardest things to do when you're a Christian or trying to figure out Christianity is to let God be the umpire and let him call the balls and strikes and not try to redefine it and spin it. But that is where darkness is in our redefinition of sin. Darkness is also in our nature. Look in verse 10. Verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a what? A liar. That can't be good. And his word is not in us. Um, you, you know, uh, we just had this sweet little baby last week. Sweet little nine pound, two ounce, littlest baby we've ever had. True story. Uh, baby. And she's so sweet. But she did not come into this world with a blank slate. That's what most of us think, right? You're born and it's the environment that screws everything up. Or your crazy parents. Or you got wayward in your teen years, but you were sweet and innocent. That's really not the way the Bible describes human nature. I'm sorry. To, I know that's popular and it'd be nice if it was true. But it's not. Look, we'll show you this in, in Romans 3. Romans 3, 23. It says, all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God or the perfection of God. All. And th this is where it gets into the baby thing. Uh, Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. In Psalm 58, 3, even from birth the wicked go astray. From the womb they are wayward and speak lies. Our sweet little baby comes into this world and she is sweet and wonderful and perfect. And you know what else she is? A sinner. You don't like that, do you? She is. You know why? Because she comes out of the womb basically saying this. Me! What? That's what babies do. They have to cry to let you know they need to be fed. They want to cry. Yeah, but it, they don't grow out of it. <laughs> I've, got, I've got stages of these creatures. <laughs> I was one of these creatures. You don't grow out of this thing. Focus on me. Pay attention to me. Make me the center of the world. Where does that come from? The Bible says it's within our very nature. And what the false teachers are doing is saying, listen, sin's not a problem for human beings. It's not a big deal. There's no tentacles reaching out affecting your life. And what's interesting is, is we, he says, if we say we have not sinned, it's in the perfect tense in the original language, meaning nothing happened in the past, nothing has an existing result. And what that is, is a very thin, shallow understanding of sin. It's basically a behavioral understanding of sin, which most of us have. Most of us think that sin is what you do. Sin is so much more than that. It's, it's, it's your motive. It's not just your motive when you do bad things. It's your, it's your bad motive when you do good things. Some of you just experienced this. You wrote a check. You dug some, uh, for some cash in your pocket, and you gave it to Mission St. Louis. And you did it for the wrong reason. Now, I want to be clear. We're not giving the money back, okay? <laughs> But some of you did it because you think if I give this, then God will like me more. And some of you did it because you think if I do this religious activity, God won't bother me about my compartmentalized sin that I have in my life. So you did a good thing with the wrong motive. How many times do you do that a day? See, sin is, is it's in our motives, it's in our attitudes, this is why if you're a parent or you, or you might be a parent someday, this is, if you don't understand this, you will, you're going to jack your kids up anyway, period. Because you're an imperfect parent. You'll do the best you can, but you won't be perfect. And they'll let you know about it, right? And then they'll be in counseling and then it'll be great, right? You, but, but, but you'll totally miss the boat if you only discipline actions. 
if I only get on to my son because he took the toy away from his sister, I'm not teaching him anything. That's just discipline the action. Don't take your toy away from your son. If you do that, go to your room. What I've got to deal with in my son is not just the action, but the attitude. What's the attitude? He's selfish, right? I'm getting to the root, not just clipping off the fruit. So sin is pervasive. It's not just our, it's not just our behavior. It's, it's down in our very motives. And to say you haven't sinned means you don't understand what sin is. You're looking at it from a pure behavioral. See, you can redefine behavior. You can redefine it. But at the root that drives it all, that's what John is pushing us toward. It's in our nature, he says, this darkness. And it has devastating consequences on our relationships, as we're going to see in the next few weeks. But it also has a vertical, not just a horizontal dimension. Because what sin does is it causes us to see God not as holy, not as light, but as useful. As an assistant to us as we maximize our potential. As a cosmic bellhop who exists to serve us. As the lenient, cool parent that looks the other way. Remember those parents? Everybody went over to their house and did God knows what because they didn't care. That's a lot, the way a lot of people think about God. And that's darkness. And John says, I'm writing to you because you're not going to get joy that way, looking at God that way. You, you're, I'm, not, I'm, I'm writing to you so that you see God in the light. And here's, I don't know if you've caught this, progression. God is light, good news. We have darkness, bad news. John ends with good news. God is light. We have darkness. But we also have forgiveness. Look in verse 9 with me. Verse 9, great verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Stop right there. I'm gonna we're going to talk about this next week. If you're a Christian, God would be unjust and, and, and not faithful if he were not to forgive you because of what he's done on the cross on your behalf. Okay, we'll get to that next week. Keep reading. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, here's the problem that Christians do with this verse. They make it prescriptive instead of descriptive. This is what I mean. This is the way I was taught this verse. Okay, you, you're going to sin, right? It's going to happen. A lot. And every time you sin, you have to confess that sin or you don't have God's forgiveness. How many have heard that? That's a lie. That is absolutely a misunderstanding of the gospel. This is not a prescriptive verse. It is a descriptive verse. And you know this because when you study the original language, it's really not if we confess. It, it's the, it's, it's a, what's called a third class conditional if, meaning since we confess. Since we confess. What I mean by that is that I want to get you lost in seminary land. What John is saying is this. You know you're a Christian because you confess your sins. You don't deny that you've sinned. You don't say that you don't have sin. You don't make all these redefinitions. You confess, meaning you agree with God. That's what the word confess means. If you are a Christian, hear me, this is good theology, and we'll break it down next week. If you are a Christian, your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. They're done. It's over. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. Your sins are forgiven because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. Now, the logical question is, well, then why confess? Here's why. I'll explain it with my son again. I'm going to, talk, I'm going to use a lot of illustrations about me and Drew because it's me and him and three ladies and one dog who's been neutered. That's what we've got in our house. So it's, there are only two. It's estrogen city, man. So me and him have to hang together, right? Um, here's what my son does, though. We, this is how I'm training him. Like, you don't hit the ladies, right? Don't hit the laser of your trains. Don't be a Hit daddy. If you're going to hit somebody, hit daddy. That's how we're, that's how, you, he's going to hit something, right? He's three. So, so if something bad's going to happen with hitting. Let's make it on dad. Dad can handle it. Dad can take it. The problem is he hits me when I'm not looking. <laughs> so I'm, I'm watching, you know, the Cardinals and a, a Thomas the Train comes upside my head, this little metal object. Now, let me ask you a question. When Drew hits me in the head with Thomas the Train, or Percy, he's very, you know, he's very nuanced. He can <laughs> grab either one. When he hits me in the head with the train and hurts me, and I'm bleeding, which happened, is he still my son? Yeah. What about if he doesn't immediately confess? Is he, is he still my son? 
what happens when, and he's starting to do this now, thank God. We were wondering, what happens when he actually says he's sorry and he really means it? And you can tell when he really means it. What, what happens? Do, do, is he more my, more my son? No, he's always my son. But now we're united. He's my son. But now our, our, our relationship, our communion is restored. This is the relationship between sin and God. When you sin as a Christian, your union with God is still there. You're still his son. You're still his daughter. It's your communion that needs to be restored, your fellowship that needs to be restored. So he's still my son, but when he agrees with me about what sin is, that is bleeding from the projectile that came out of your hand. When he agrees with me, we embrace and our fellowship is restored. Our communion is restored. The union has always been there. That's, that's what it means to confess. That's why John says, you're a Christian because you confess. When you understand that your sins are forgiven, when you understand you're a son or daughter, no matter what, because of what Christ has done for you, when you get that, you will be safe to confess. You will be safe to acknowledge anything because you're safe in his arms. You're his son, you're his daughter. Now, if you're a moralist, you won't. When you're a moralist, you think it's your behavior. You kind of got this resume that you're presenting to God every day with your, with your good works and your good life. You'll never confess when you're a moralist because you think it's your work that keeps you in union with God, not Christ's blood. And so the thought that comes in your head when you think about confessing is this. How could God want me? I'm such a failure. Now, let me just submit this to you. How, if that thought comes in your head a lot and you listen to it, how could God want me? I'm such a failure. You don't understand the gospel. You may be very religious, very moralistic. You're not living in the reality of the gospel. Likewise, that's, you, can miss, you can miss it to the right. You can miss it to the left. You're a relativist. You're not going to confess your sin because that would mean to acknowledge that there is a standard that exists outside of, self, outside of yourself by which you must comply. And so when you think about sin, you're driven away by this thought. Well, how can God define sin so narrowly? And it drives you away. But when you're a Christian and you understand who God is, you will freely confess your sins. Why? Because you know that your sin is darkness and it's juxtaposed next to God's light. And you see not only the light, but you see the darkness. And if you only see that, you will crawl up in the fetal position and stay in your room. But thank God there's a third part. You see Jesus taking all of your darkness, all of your sin upon himself. And so, you know what you do? You confess because it's in the light. You know you can't hide. You know, you know that he's there and that he's made, he, he's your advocate as we're going to see in chapter 2. And he's made room for you, for your immaturity and imperfection. Now, how do you apply this? How does this all work together? Okay, so I'm just assuming that we're all going to go sin. It's a pretty good assumption. Me too. What do you do? What do you do? Okay, let me show you this verse. We'll get into it more next week. 1 Peter 2, 24. We just studied this book a few months ago. This is the key. He himself, it says, bore our sins in his body on the tree, talking about the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Novel thought. Uh, novel thought. Jesus died so that we don't have to live in sin. So the key is here to experience joy. The whole thing's about joy, remember. John says, I'm writing these things to you so you have complete, sustained, full Joy. How does it happen? This is why nobody, for the most part, lives in this joy-filled life that, that God calls us to, because it involves pain. And see, many of us, because of the consequences of our own sin, our own dumb choices, our lives are full of pain. More of us than you can even imagine, percentage-wise in this room, have been so sinned against and, and, and nothing we did wrong, but we've been sinned against, and we have pain from that. So we have pain in our past, we have pain in our present, and then I'm telling you, if you're going to get joyful, you've got to look at pain. It doesn't sound real attractive. 
Not real user-friendly. I understand it. It's paradoxical, though. What John is saying is, you, to get joy, you have to stare into the blazing glory of God's light. Now, have you looked at the sun for a long time lately? Don't do it. Remember when you, the, your parents told you not to and then you did anyway? What does it do when you look at the sun? It burns your retinas, right? Permanent blindness in some Don't do that. But even if you just look at a light, you know, just I look up at these lights, ah, you can't do it. It's painful. John says you have to. You have to see God's light because it's in God's light that you see your own darkness. If you don't see God's light, you will redefine darkness. You will ignore darkness. You will blame your darkness on someone else. You have to see your sin for what it is. It's painful. It, it is. I'm in a season right now, honestly, where I am seeing, you kind of get, after a while as a Christian, you kind of get a rhythm and you're not doing the stuff you used to do, so you kind of feel proud about it. But then God sh shows you another deeper level. And you see motives that are wrong for doing And I'm just in a season where I'm like, can I do anything wrong? I mean, it's, I would be lost if I just looked at the darkness. But it's painful. But here's, here's what makes the gospel the gospel. We don't just look at God's holiness. We don't just look at our sin. We look at the place where holiness and love meet, which is the cross. And if you will look at the cross, and this is what Peter's telling us to do, look at Jesus on the cross where mercy and justice meet. See him hanging there for you, taking all the wrath of God for you, serving as your substitute for your imperfect life for you. Look at him. Look at him. And that will destroy the attracting power of sin. It will nullify it. It will kill it. But it's painful. And you will no longer be tempted to ignore your sin or redefine it or excuse it or try to work it off. You will confess it freely and you will walk in the light. It's just like marriage. There's, there's so many correlations here. So many. Those of you who have been married for a while, I've been married 16 years. I know some, some of you got me beat by a lot of years. We dated for five years before we got married. Um, we got married in middle school. We're not that old. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we've, been, we've known each other for a long time to the point that we're watching a movie and I see a scene and I know exactly what she's thinking and her me. I know her responses. As we've gotten to know each other, I have, I have learned to love what she loves. I used to hate chick movies. Now I can watch them and kind of love them sometimes or at least pretend like I do. I've learned to hate what she hates, right? I've even learned to not rebel against the things that she does. Like, um, for whatever reason, she did not learn as a kid that you squeeze the toothpaste from the bottom of the <laughs> thing. She does the middle. Now, I do it too. <laughs> I'm not mad about it. I've learned to agree with her about the things I used to rebel against in her. That's what it means to walk in the light. We'll talk about it next week. This doctrine is called progressive sanctification, meaning that as you walk with God, you learn to anticipate how, how he would respond in a situation. And you respond that way. You don't learn to love what he loves and hate what he hates. And you, more and more of your life is in the light. You don't have secret sins. You don't have things to hide. You don't have shame tearing you down because you've got this compartmentalized, quarantined part of your life that you don't want anybody to see and you think that God can't see. You just, you're, you're just free to give it up because you're safe in his arms, because you're his son and you're his daughter. And that's what John is inviting us to. And he's saying that is where joy is. When you're completely open, not perfect, but you're open, and when God says, that needs to change, you say, yes, Lord, I believe you, and I know that freedom is found in, in doing what you say, and so I'm gonna give that up. I'm gonna stop setting my own agenda. I'm gonna stop being the hero of my own story. I'm gonna give you your rightful, pla your, your rightful place. In the beginning, God, it started with you, God. It ends with you, God. You're the subject, you're the object. You're the lover of my soul. And I'm gonna confess Let's do that together as a church. Pray with me. Lord, I pray that we would do just that, that we would feel safe. Some of us have never felt safe in our life. And I pray that you would press into us the, the reality that we can be safe in you.
that we can be safe in you. And that we can be free to confess our deepest, darkest sins. And not just to confess them, but to repent, to turn. Not just to see and not just to own, but to turn. Show us what that looks like, Lord. I pray that many people would take advantage of our prayer time after the service. That we would have deep conversations over lunch. Not just about the Rams or the Cardinals, but about our souls. And the sins that we tolerate. So, Lord, expose our darkness and help us realize it is the best thing. When we turn the lights on, I know all of us have lived in a weirdo apartment or some kind of, and you turn the lights on and there are bugs everywhere. That's disconcerting unless you know how to deal with the bugs. The bugs are there. The light exposes them. God, you want to get rid of the bugs. So, Lord, we trust you to turn the light on and all the dirty, nasty things that are in our life, you're going to crush. You're going to exterminate. Give us insight, Lord. Give us um, hope that that can be so.